Ready? Yep. 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 Right, we're call the meeting to order. If you can call the roll, please, Mr. Platko. Jennifer Harden. Here. Jack Miley. Here. Belinda Grassy. Here. Tom Hack. Here. Steve Jeffries. Here. Rise for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On behalf of the board, I would like to welcome all students, staff, parents, and interested community members to tonight's Board of Education meeting. I would like to remind everyone that this is a meeting of the Board of Education held in public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not to be considered a public community meeting. There is time for public comment during the meeting in the public participation section on the agenda. First up, I'd like to make a motion to approve the hmm, minutes. What are the minutes? Uh, February 26, 2019. The February 26, 2019 meeting if I can have a second please. I'll second. Thank you Mrs. Grassi. Is there any discussion? Okay, not call the roll please. Steve Jeffries. Aye. Jennifer Hardin. Aye. Jack Marley. Aye. Belinda Grassi. Aye. Tom Hatch. Aye. The motion carried. And that takes us to special reports please. We have our standing uh, monthly report with uh, Chris. He's here from uh, ICON to give the board an update on our construction projects. Okay, um, both projects are pretty much exactly on track with each other now. Uh, weather's turning, we're working on the year, which is good. I think that's some good news since last meeting with the windows. Right now they're coming mid-May with a chance of that can move up a week. So we don't have the worry that we would have had if they would have come in the building. Case three inside the building, up on the second floor, will be completed at Concord this week and probably Wednesday next week at Madison. We're done with masonry and the building outside of some chase walls. Uh, the paint team has started in both buildings, in areas D and the cafeteria, the gymnasium, the kitchen, moving into the office area. For that. The tech contractors out there now, uh, ready to pull strings, we're going to start, uh, we'll start pulling their technology cable. Everything's moving right along. We're upstairs with the infrastructure now. We're just about just about done with it on the first floor and we're going up on the second floor. Things are moving well and the weather's cooperating in our favor right now. Great. Did you want to add anything, Mr. Hack? We both took a tour. Uh, yesterday. Yeah, a review. Um, yeah, it's, it was just such a transformation when we were all there, I don't know, gosh, was it before, before Christmas? Probably yeah. in, in the time frame. Yeah. Um, you just, you cannot believe the transformation of the building. So all the, the roofs are on, the uh, the second floor, the buildings are, or the, the rooms are defined, the, the pods are defined. Um, uh, the painting was going on while we were, we were actually taking the tour. They're, they have uh, temporary heat, so so that it's all dried right out, and it just it, it just it really is, is coming along. The um, uh, you know we saw pictures at least uh, you know descriptions of the veneer, and then some of the veneer is, is going on the veneer brick. I will tell you that that it is is much more uh, appealing in person than it was even in the drawings from my perspective anyway so i think we're we're really on on course and speed to, to have some some terrific buildings and uh, I, I know that we're also we talked about schedule a little bit yesterday and i think it's going to be on the agenda as well but uh it just really we've had some bad weather that it's affected us but we've, we've really come a long way well any of these change orders that that are on here now i think we're up to change order number 27 or 28 uh, will that delay the project at all? No. Uh, the majority of change orders that are on there is work that we already did. Some of it just till we worked out what we wanted to do with the windows, we didn't hold up the work on the change orders where there was some glass involved. So we got to work. Since, so since nothing's holding anything up. Since this is our first rodeo, so to speak, in terms of a construction project in our district, um, we were kind of concerned about how many change orders there were. And as we found out through the experts at uh, ICON, we're really not above no, any more I than anyone else. There's 30 change orders at Concord and maybe 26 in Madison, and that is not a lot of Okay. Yeah. We were thinking the there's same projects thing. where they're, at this point, they're well gone. Sounds and good. You're, the, this is fine. I mean, it's nothing outrageous has been. So, and your big ones were are unknowns until we got out of now. Can you can you get the board a real quick update on that one casting that needs to be recast? The issue. Oh, it's already recast. Oh, yes. 
Do you we had um, the three tanks, concrete tanks for the uh, STS treatment mm -hmm. system at Concord. The manufacturer, when they were making one, the sleeve had floated. It, it, it actually floated in the concrete, so it was not at the right inward elevation. That they could have capped that, scored it, put another sleeve in and that, but we just said no, we're making new one. We wanted it the way it was designed, the way yep. it was ordered, and the way it was paid for. Not an issue, but they, they asked. Not an issue, and the tanks are coming down. Okay. So that, that was all taken care of. It's, it's not an issue. It's okay. Yeah, you just I, again, you just can't believe the the transformation. It just really is looking looking terrific, and and you know they're you can't get the full effect because they they have uh, temporary windows in place, you, with some plastic. But we, we get to see the the views out the windows and the dynamics of the building. I, it's not only going to be a great place for for learning. It's it's going to be really great. It's going to be as aesthetically really appealing as well. It's yeah, just, it really, I think it's. We're, we're moving in a great direction. Of course, I have one question uh, regarding uh, the the roadway out the, out there in Concord. Uh, when does the state of Ohio or Concord get involved with uh, the markings uh, on the roadway out there uh, for traffic out, out in that area? The markings on the roadway, as far as uh, how much traffic flow are, are they already determined that? It's no problem at all. Truck traffic? Did they do a traffic study? From what I understand now, we're yeah, they're they they may come back in after the fact and do that, but they would do that. The only thing we're doing is we're moving, which would affect your speed. Is the one uh, downhill grade sign, the flashing sign, is being moved off. Okay. But the the speed limit has not changed on the road. Thank you. Would the board be interested in taking another visit sometime soon? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any particular building? I know the, the last time we were at um, Riverview, I, I, I personally want to go to Parkside, so we'll go to Parkside. But uh, I'm going to do that regardless of what the Yeah, I was at Parkside about. a couple weeks ago, but I'm, I'll, I'm happy to go anywhere you want. I have a feeling it's probably changed in the last couple of weeks. I bet it <laughs> has. <laughs> um, is there any particular day or a time of day? I don't know. I mean, do we want to do what we did last time and just do it before the, a board meeting? That, that I, mean, I was going to say after after work would be best for me, so that would qualify. Maybe we could do it before our next. I think April 29th is the next board meeting. It's a Monday. It'll be warmer up then too. Yeah, you know, you want to give yourself a little more time because I can guarantee you you're going to spend a lot more time in the building. Now. There's so much more to see, and you're actually and there's upstairs to it, go it, to. It's as well, there. Yeah. Everything is there now. Yeah. So do we want to say like? I mean, like, I mean, like, an, how, how long are you talking? Our board meeting starts at seven. If we get there at six, no, <laughs> five, uh, five thirty, an hour and a half, almost two hours. Long yeah, so I would say you can get there at five. Okay. Can everyone do five o'clock on April 29th? Yeah. Yeah, if you do that, that meeting. Time to walk can you do it? <laughs> Jimmy, okay with that? Yeah. All right. So April 29th at five p.m. Please. Parkside. Park. What do we say? Did we decide? Park okay. Park yeah. Park yeah. Park it's rocking it. I, I park, so. <laughs> That's where Tom's going. That, that would be better for everybody. It's easier to get into the site. Park site? Yeah. yeah. So it's April 29, April 29 at 5. Yes, please. Is 5 or 5.30 better? Two hours might be a little longer. 5 there. would probably be better. You think so? We still have a chance at over here as well, which is and get get settled and everything. So I I, I have fun. You could spend a good hour, 15, even an hour yeah. and a half in there and then make it here by a quarter to seven. We plan on having a basketball game and a uh, finished gym over there. So. We don't have any hoops yet, so. <laughs> 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 Jim can't get in the hoop anymore. We virtually can't They're adjustable. We'll have to. Five feet. I grew up in town. That offers any time, I mean, that they come out as a group where we're out there. Even if I'm not, it doesn't matter if I'm there. Come by, Yeah, you can go individually. All you do is check in at the trailer there and get a hard hat on, and I'll take you through. Yeah. I'll let the guys know, too, if you're watching. Too, that's why we had you here. Yeah. Just bring the keys if you're going over to Madison. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Madison's so, checking money. And as I recall from the conversation yesterday, that uh, the staff from from Leroy Elementary did stop by and take a look at it. Yes, took them at two tours because it's, it's kind of difficult to take that, that many and, and they, they were really excited yeah. about building, spend some time. 
them up a lot of that the Sharpies and wanted to write their names on the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Lots awesome. of good questions, lots of exciting. Great. Thank Anything you. else, guys? All right. Thank Thanks, Chris. Chris. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Thanks. I also asked Mr. Boers, uh, as we're getting our report from our director, to give us a quick update on our athletic uh, department, athletic programs. And uh, we'll probably have them back in also in a couple months to, to give a uh, more comprehensive report with um, a lot of um, accomplishments from some of our uh, athletes over the year, course of the year. And yeah. A lot of good things happen. And bring, bring bright people in, in person yeah. could be the kind of goal too. I mean, try to be somewhat comprehensive. So first of all, thanks for having me. Give me a couple minutes. Uh, appreciate it. All right, so some updates. And there's questions along the way. Uh, whatever else you guys need. Because the lasers not work on the TV, so I may be moving back and forth. Um, Okay, a couple things. We're going to go with some highlights first. I, I tried to stick with the high school. I was looking at middle school. I was looking at alum. We got some great things going on from everybody, but just just became so much. So we we'll at least start with the high school stuff. Um, so these are accomplishments, teams, and individuals through the winter to this point. Uh, first off, so we got highlights from the course, meaning the cross country course. Uh, Cheyenne Durr was a regional qualifier. Uh, pretty awesome. Um, our boys cross country team were regional qualifiers. I guess so. Yeah. AJ <laughs> Haffa, 37th in the state of Ohio. Uh, it's tremendous. There's a picture of AJ getting his clap out before he left. Uh, on the court, we had our volleyball team, which was conference champs again. They were district champs. It was pretty nice. They beat Mentor. Uh, they were regional semifinalists, which is uh, the stage right before the state tournament. And Coach Schultz was uh, WRC Coach of the Year, so that was pretty awesome. sweet. Uh, also on the court, tennis court, Sarah Salen and Ange Angelica Ross were district qual qualifiers. That also was the um, right before the state meet. And then Angelica was able to advance and became a state qualifier, so she was down there uh, as well. So pretty proud of her. Uh, on the field, the uh, football team was conference champs for the first time in five years, a regional semifinalist and uh, he happened to have the school's first ever playoff victory. So it was pretty exciting, proud of, proud of those guys. Um, well, also, so yes, sir. What coaches uh, had any rewards uh, from uh, football? <laughs> um, WRC. Yeah, uh, I was fortunate enough to be a WRC co-coach of the year. Was it? Um, I was Lake County Big School co-coach of the year with Coach River Sound from Mentor and uh, was a finalist for the Bob Ritley Award. Shortly, um, which was News Herald, uh, Northeast Ohio, one of the awards old uh, Perry coach, who was very influ influential um, in football in the area. Um, thanks. More on the field, Jalen McCauley, uh, one of the football players. That's his picture from um, him committing to Lake Erie College, but the reason he's up there is uh, he was the Max Prep Ohio High School Player of the Week for all sports after a week 11 victory over Nordonia. Um, he was a leading tackler in all divisions in the entire state of Ohio. Well, look how big he is, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's why I was leading right. tackler, you know? Um, from the map, uh, our wrestling team won the Riverside Rumble. <laughs> we were WRC champs for the first time in 11 years. We had nine district qualifiers from the wrestling team. Chris Rocha was a state alternate. And Coach Richner was WRC Coach of the Year. So proud of those guys. Um, also from the court, uh, Marissa Radmore, sophomore. She was a ninth in the state in block shots, according to Max Prep. So awesome. um, there's your at the bottom kind of stats and blocks. Uh, court also, our boys basketball team hosted the first ever home playoff game. So that was special because they were obviously a higher seed over, over Mayfield. Um, Andrew Keller did a couple uh, crazy things on the court as well as the football field for us. But school record 55 points in a single game versus Chardon, which made that much sweeter. And he also scored his 1,000 points of his career this season. So pretty cool stuff there. Uh, the pool, Cal Silver, 7th in the state in the 100 butterfly. Charles Marshall, uh, 20th in the state in the 100 backstroke. And Ian Diffenbacher, Eddie Cocos, Charles Marshall, and Cal Silver, 24th in the state, the 200 medley relay. Um, so there's Eddie, there's Ian, there's Kyle, there's Charles, 
there's a guy who just happened to be in the pit. <laughs> so a tough time getting him out of there. But uh, so all four of those guys went down the state, and a couple of them had a couple different events. So proud of them. Signing day, we had uh, some of our athletes assigned day. There's uh, a good chunk more coming up this spring, but these are the ones that made their decisions. Uh, from left to right, Nick Malacher, Carnegie Mellon University, Division Three school. Uh, Asia Half, a full ride uh, to run. Bowling Green State University in the middle. And Mike Wojciechowski, Case Western Reserve University. Um, obviously with a full ride to run, AJ in the middle uh, speaks volumes about what they thought of his uh, abilities and his academics. Important to note that because the uh, outer two guys are football guys, I kind of know a little more about them. They both were top recruits for both of their respective universities, talking to their head coaches. So pretty, pretty awesome to see, especially you know when we start talking about academics and, and taking the next step. Happenings and updates, a few things to update everyone about. Uh, Twitter, we're trying to ramp up the athletic Twitter. Uh, for those of you that are following, trying to follow along a little more, we got word out to all the coaches to make sure they include the Riverside Athletics handle uh, whenever they tweet something. So we try and um, get the communication out to the community and they all interested stakeholders as best we can, at least a starting point with that. Um, final forms, this is something that's pretty cool. Um, we're going to this, we have like a little soft rollout this spring. And one of the main reasons for this platform is for compliance, emergency management, streamlining, communication. In a nutshell, what it is, it's a platform where we're able to, for athletics, minimize all paperwork for parents. So we can get physicals, emergency medical forms, everything that needs to be done online. And once you're in the database, it's done unless information changes. So instead of having to fill out something for a fall sport, a spring sport, you know, the next winter sport, one time and it's done. Coaches can access all of the emergency medical information from any smart device. So something happens, they obviously still want to carry it with them, but emergency is just another way to get the stuff. In terms of compliance, physicals, coaching certifications, anything else, it's all on here and we can keep track of it through the athletic department once it gets uploaded and we have record of that. And the nice thing about the final forms, what it does, is it sends out reminder emails. It sends out reminder, hey coach, 30 days and you're about to expire. Hey coach, 10 days you're about to expire. Hey parent and student athlete, 30 days your physical is going to expire. Make sure you do something about it. And so we're able to, to kind of streamline and, and again unify as well as comply with, with everything we need to comply with law wise. Does it have anything in there as far as reminding parents about pay to participate fees and things like that? Does that? Yes. And the nice thing is we can actually then pull out specific groups or whole groups and we can message as okay. well. So we can start now, once you've signed up for it and you're in the database, we can get information. As simple as like today, we had canceled the JV baseball scrimmage. JV baseball team, scrimmage canceled, practice from three to five. And it's just immediate uh, communication to everyone involved. So, um, but yes, pay participate. We can get information about all that stuff. Nice. Um, and again, it's just a little bit more about it. Just, just cut and paste a couple things. Um, you can look at it or go back to it. Send to anybody who wants to to look at that stuff. I won't read everything for you. Uh, one thing I think we're really proud of is booster presidents meetings. Uh, we've had about four meetings with all booster presidents and again in order to unify we're not we're not taking away each individual booster group and what they're able to do but again the, the, the thought is to unify everyone to get everyone on the same page we're not you know overlapping fundraisers where we're not going to the same vendor multiple times we're collaborating with ideas uh the reason the coke cola logos up there is we've we've all kind of collaborated with our coke rep we don't have a contract is expired at the moment but what we've done is we've been able to you know power in you know numbers with purchasing uh, we've been able to get five new coolers from coca-cola for all our booster groups um, to utilize a refrigerator baseball team is going to be utilizing just some some different things um, where again the power in numbers uh, and unifying that goes from band boosters all the way down through lacrosse so that's been been pretty nice and, and it's really helping unify the department um, as well as stakeholders and, and a lot of the adults of who's you know has a vested interest in what's going on so that's been really good really proud of that uh, paying referees umpires and officials arbiter sports is where we do our scheduling 
Um, and that's kind of a universal thing in the state of Ohio. We had not utilized to this point um, able to pay the officials online. We used to have to get them to go through filling out a voucher, social security number, whole thing that we had to submit the payroll, they had to wait. Um, there was rumor out there because of that, uh, we maybe missed out on some, some of the better officials at times being able to, to get them here because they didn't feel like waiting for payment or whatever else. This now can be paid instantaneously. All they do is fill out record that they were here or I can see that they were here. We go in, click a button, submit for payment. It's good to go. So that's something. Again, nothing crazy, but just just something to help streamline things and make things more efficient. Um, minimizing money spent on tickets, we get 3,500 tickets from uh, a group called Huddle Tickets. A lot of the schools in the area use them. You may have seen them. We've got the coupons on the back, but so they're free tickets as long as you know we communicate with them in timely fashion. And obviously, we're okay with the vendors on there. Um, with the coupons, so we definitely have taken advantage of that. We're able to save uh, already $500 this year on purchasing the Riverside tickets because we're using these first. So just something that we're taking advantage of and keeping that relationship up with them. Uh, strength and speed for all athletes. We went through the athletic department, an app called Team Builder. Uh, it's also a platform. The football team has been using it, and so is the PE department under Coach Schussler. Well, we went ahead and we hooked up the entire uh, athletic department, all coaches. Uh, we communicated with them. Coach Schussler has been training any coach that wants to. And all it is is uh, you go into that weight room. If you're not familiar as a coach with maybe a lot of what you're doing and developing workouts and don't have time, there are predetermined workouts for in-season, out-of-season for all sports and all athletes. So again, it's just another avenue to assist our coaches in training their players. Um, and this is a picture, and the reason that one's up there is we have three teams working out in that beautiful facility at one time, uh, getting work in and, and doing what needs to be done. So uh, again, it's worked well for the football program and the PE department, so now we've tried to advance it to all our coaches and again, just give them another opportunity um, to feel more comfortable and to make their jobs easier and more efficient in training their athletes. Because again, this is extremely important. Um, you know, you go all the way down to the Pee Wee Leagues, the, usually the bigger ones, the faster ones, the stronger ones, dominate. It's no different at our level. Um, and then even more importantly, injury prevention from your, your common injuries to concussions. The more, the stronger your, your neck and shoulders are, you minimize, um, you know, the whiplash of the neck, minimizes the concussion risk. So that's something that we're really taking very seriously in the department is making sure we get the opportunity for all athletes. Um, to be able to be trained. Uh, how's the equipment holding up? Tremendous. Yeah, it's really, really good. Thank you. Uh, in the works, a couple things in the works and I'll be done. Um, sticking on the training our student athletes. Uh, Lake Health sent something out about a month ago where they're starting to pilot a program where they're able to uh, send a few of their certified trainers, athletic trainers, and not necessarily just taping and whatnot or diagnosing injuries and rehab, but literally for strength training, strength and speed training. And so we took them up, Coach Sussler and I have met with them twice. Ironically, another meeting was this afternoon. And uh, we're gonna try and pilot a program with them for them coming out uh, for a couple hours a day after school. And the objective would be is to also, again, help those coaches who are not 100% confident and familiar down in the weight room, giving them certified trainers to kind of take charge. So we would have maybe a two to three hour block Monday through Friday uh, where let's say we have the soccer programs in there first and it's track and cross country and then football would finish and then we have volleyball and then you have lacrosse and we're still working out the logistics but we'd send them down there, the coaches would kind of come help learn but then these trainers would kind of take charge. They would develop the programs, they would develop the workouts, they would keep tabs on our kids. Um, football is probably going to pilot it because it's something that um, they are charging for. So we're looking for the booster groups to be able to pick up the slack for this. And football is already committed. The gridiron club is already committed um, X amount. And because it just is what it is, we're somewhat familiar with all of So we kind of want to see what, what they can bring to the table. Want to see if what they're bringing is legit and um, if it's something we want to move forward with. So we're going to pilot it part of April through May to the end of school year and then the summertime and then we'll go from there. And it's important to note that even like our volleyball team has already outsourced their training. Allie Schultz uh, hired um, Elite last year to come in and train her girls because she knows the importance of strengthening and conditioning for 
um, her sport, she wants to take it to the next level, state level. Well, this would hopefully maybe unify everything and they wouldn't have to do that. So um, that's what we got in the works with Lake Health. Uh, huddle. This is a, a, it's not huddle tickets, it's a different kind of huddle. Again, there are three teams already in our athletic department that utilize this, football being a big one, and it's able for film breakdown, for recruiting, um, for talking with your athletes just about how to get better and, and uh, technique, form, everything else. Met with a huddle representative last week, and, and there's a way to get a major discount with the athletic department. So again, I'm going to be going to boosters with that. Um, and he's able to even talk about bringing a camera, mounting it in the field house. And the camera <coughs> goes by motion, so they can take practices, they can do whatever needs to be done, we can utilize. And then one of the big things is recruiting. It's a recruiting uh, tool, and we use it a lot with football, sending out game film and communicating with colleges uh, for our kids. Uh, so now everyone will have access to that. So that's, that's a great tool. Isn't it? I mean, it's, it is. I mean, it's just down just, the distance. You can play over video over and over again. You can slow it down, speed it up. Right. So. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's great. So we figure, again, let, let's get everyone on it and, and utilizing it. Uh, lastly, here's something we're working on. This is probably the last thing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I realize the time with rescheduling spring events is, is, is now hit me square in the jaw. <laughs> so with the weather and, and the fields. and uh, But we're looking to get athletic handbooks going. Uh, Apparently. And the student athlete athletic handbook, then a coach's handbook, where you come here, it's Riverside Athletics, here's the expectation. I'm a student athlete from a parent, here's what we expect of you, here's our high expectations. Coaches, here's what we expect of you, not only for um, you know getting all your forms in, your certifications and licensures, but how you handle the press and media, what we expect, you know, how you handle your athletes, uh, how you communicate with parents, things like that. So uh, that's something that's a little bit further down, but already we've already got it started. Um, but to do it right, it, it may be a little while yet. How's the transportation working out uh, uh, in taking teams after school? We, I know some other districts are struggling uh, getting them out there. I haven't heard anything from my office at all. I mean, we're, we're slow right now, so in the cancellations, so never really <laughs> the spring is, spring is a busy time for... Yeah, but the only thing that's really started is lacrosse and baseball right now. <coughs> baseball from Kansas, so we right. have two lacrosse now, so it's a little right now, so we're good. No, yeah, Trish Place has done a pretty good job, yeah. you know, I mean, it really has, so... That's why I ask, because typically I'll, I'll hear, I'll get some calls and I haven't... <coughs> don't call me, please. Uh, <laughs> usually at this time of year, I do get some calls about that, and I haven't received one. So Gotcha. Good. Um, that's it. That's it. Just a quick update for everybody and, and bring up speed. Any questions? Well, we've been having an awesome year for our sports. Yeah, kids, it's, those coaches have been doing a great job. I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really come together. I mean, we Hopefully our spring does the same. And it, incidentally, while we're talking... You know about the, the sports and whatnot. We had our first girls lacrosse game with our new um, field. The, the lines painted and, and uh, you know appropriately on there. So we had those done this uh, on Sunday. We had some professional come in and do it for us. So our maintenance department needs to touch it up. They can, but uh, we used the yellow to try and kind of match it up with the other soccer lines. And I know Coach Monterelli was was pretty happy. I talked to him. Uh, after it was done, so we was pleased with that. So we're moving, we're moving along. It's good stuff. It's good, yeah. good stuff. I would like to also point out that um, at the high school level, we're doing amazing things, but also at the junior high, junior highs level, <coughs> we're doing great things. Seventh and eighth grade um, girls, both teams. Seventh won, grade girls right? and seventh grade boys both had undefeated basketball undefeated seasons. Undefeated basketball and seasons, and they won the tournament. All right. So uh, we're doing great things, and this is mainly because of passing these prior levies, uh, getting more kid, more of our students out to participate in sports, and it's only going to help when they get up there at the high school level. So you congratulations and thank you for everything that, that you're of, doing. That was one of the biggest detriments for our program. I mean, yes. We're forced to increase the pay to participation. Uh, participation numbers decreased. And now uh, that we have it more manageable, in fact, it's better than a lot of districts that neighbor us, um, that there are more kids going out and participating. There's no question. And, and I think a, a huge <coughs> you know, residual effect is keeping them here. Yes. You know, keeping our great kids and families here and providing services. So, yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. So, okay. okay thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you.
includes that report. You have on here TDA. TDA. Oh, TDA. I'm sorry. You are right back there. <coughs> Hi, Emily. Dana is from TDA and Scott Clifford. We just wanted to give uh, a quick update. I believe you have a schedule that was passed out. If not, I have extra copies here. Do you have one? You don't want to pass them out. Okay, no problem. It's a schedule that was emailed to us. But, um, yeah, it was we didn't get paper to the right. It's yeah. a large one. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, sorry. There's one underneath there. It's small. So just a quick update. What we did was put together a full campaign schedule just leading up to the November bond campaign and this is for phase two um, and just to give the board an update on where we are at and what we've um, been working on since the beginning of this year thank you so uh, we had a kickoff meeting in January. Um, in February, the validation of the high school and field house took place. And then in, uh, just recently, in, on the 5th of March, we got together with the core committee and presented the findings of the validation um, and the assessment, um, the previous assessment that had taken place. Um, so during that time, um, we spoke with the group about how to kind of further engage throughout that re or really our information gathering phase um, that we're currently in right now. And um, I talked about conducting an observation day where our team would come out to the high school and, and really it provides us spend a day in the high school where we're looking at site circulation, pick up drop off, um, operations of the overall school, um, traffic within the school. Um, it gives us a better sense of, of just overall culture. So um, we were able to coordinate that on March 15th, uh, which was very helpful for the team again, and just having a basic understanding of, of current state um, to help kind of inform the process as we move forward. So that's been a crucial part of our information um, gathering phase um, throughout March. Um, and then as part of our research phase as well, um, the team is currently conducting building capacity studies and educational adequacy studies. That will be completed at the end of March and then we'll be looking at the beginning of April to set up another review meeting with the core team to present out those findings. Um, and then, um, you know, again, further the process as, as part of this um, initial planning phase. So that'll, um, as I mentioned, because uh, spring break is next week, so we'll, we'll send out an email and check availability to get that on the schedule in early April. Um, and then what came out of our review meeting for the validations was, um, we had mentioned this in our interview, but the interest in setting up an educational visioning session um, to bring everyone together. So I've been working very closely with Melissa. We did establish a date on April 4th. Thursday, April 4th, um, to schedule that educational vis visioning session. And that'll invite a variety of different stakeholders um, to come and provide input, help vet priorities in a real all-day interactive session. So another key, key part of the process is, again, this informational um, gathering session um, that we're, or period that we're currently in. So we're really excited to get that on the books and, and again, gather that information to support the planning process as we move forward. So those are some of the key, I, th I think, just milestones in looking at, at the month ahead. Um, and then for the board meeting on the 29th, we'll come and present the findings from that overall research phase and then um, the educational visioning report, which will provide a hard copy to be able to share the output from that session. But you do have the, I, I don't want to take up too much time, but you do have the full schedule that leads up to this along with steps that are involved as well as deliverables and um, expected presentations that will, will come in. But we'll be attending every board meeting just to share updates with you and, and address and answer any questions. So how does the schedule change if we look at this and say, you know, November is too soon, we want to look at next May. How does that affect the schedule? Absolutely, no problem. The, we will coordinate as usual. The steps are still gonna, some process or some phases will just elongate, okay. but it can absolutely be customized. That's what we're working towards right now, but if that changes anywhere throughout the process, we'll revise. Thank you. Very good. The only thing to remember is 2020 is an elect presidential election year, so there's only the a March primary, not the typical February May. 
Well, yeah, I want to mention that you're a, a Riverside grad, yeah. so you're familiar with all oh, yeah. of the, uh, it was, uh, the activities that were going on the other day. Yeah, I got I got to be here last week, and uh, I really kind of enjoyed all the nostalgia of being around here. Yeah. Did you eat lunch? No. Just running down the hall. Have you seen any of your old teachers? A few. Yes. Okay. I was, sadly, they didn't recognize me. Um, it's probably the beard. Right? <laughs> and uh, Emily's a resident tonight. Yes, awesome. Yes, only ten minutes away. And I will say, it was really neat to to spend the day in the school. Um, everyone is extremely welcoming. You're invited into a classroom um, just by walking by. So it was really neat to get that sense of just community welcomeness and and seeing the kids. I think one of my takeaways was I said, you know, all the students are so friendly and kind to one another even in the hallways that you know a lot, sometimes you may see some pushing around but i mean everyone was very cordial and it was refreshing to see your comment was the parking lot uh, flows much better than what it was when you oh were yeah <laughs> we only had like a one entrance when i was yeah. here it was, it's crazy <laughs> it's made a big difference yes yes that's very helpful i'm so looking forward to april 4th April fourth. Yeah. Yes, it's going to be a it's going to be a great session. So more to come on that. Um, working with Melissa on the location um, and then invitations as well. Okay, great. Anybody got questions? Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Now that exactly. finishes special. <laughs> All right, that takes us to old business. If anyone has anything, how about new business? All right. That then meet, takes us to Board of Education Committee and Liaison Reports. The first thing is a Superintendent's Business Advisory. There was a meeting, was that, that was last week, right? Early in the morning. I don't know, I couldn't go, it's in the morning. Uh, uh, the next one, I think, <laughs> I think the next one is going to be the uh, projects. At the oh, the Senior we Fair? We a real large number. Uh, Mr. Riazzo uh, sent me that number. I think it was like, around 188 checks. Uh, and that's May 29th. Are they going to do it in the field house again? Because it was it's really packed in there last year. have to. There's more every year. It's more. Oh, I. You're right. 188. 188. Turned in projects so far. I think we started off with like 50, and then next year it was like 90. Next year, it just keeps on going on. It's a lot of fun to go to. Yeah. It's really it's, neat. I let me just echo that. I, so yeah. my daughter graduated last year, and then when I was board president as well. I got to go. It's, it's, it's truly fascinating. It's yeah. it's not only interesting to see what the what the students have pursued. It's also interesting to see what what different things are in our community. Right? You just you, you don't think of all the things that come together to make you know Lake County work, or even mm -hmm. you know going into Kyle County or whatever. But it's there's so many different facets and interesting things. It just it's the, every every stop is fascinating. When I take my I bring my kids with me to it every year. My three and um, I, it's really interesting to actually. T have the kids talk to the students too and some of these students that go to this thinking like oh I absolutely want to be this when I grow up right and they go oh my gosh after two weeks I don't want to do this at all and so it's just it's a really interesting conversation though to hear the kids have with younger students <coughs> have the same, the need. I love that not only valuing what they might want to do so uh, there's also value in finding out that you don't want to for do sure without a doubt. There is. Without a doubt. it's a great it's, it's a great opportunity Yep. That is key. So May 29th, yeah, that definitely. <laughs> Go to that for sure if you can. May 29th at 7 p.m., right? No, 29th. Right, 29th at 7? That's what I have written yeah, down. I don't know the, the time, but yeah, who is it from, right? Okay. I get that out to you from the yep. Okay, the takes is curriculum and programming and booster organizations. Okay, Mr. since Meyer. the last meeting, um, we have not had a meeting, but that being said, Thursday we have both meetings. There you go. <laughs> 7 a.m. 7 a.m. and uh, 5 30, I believe, for the boosters. A.m.? P.m. Okay. I think. Right? Coach Boris, that reminds me too, is if possible that you guys Six. include Mr. Miley on the president booster meetings you guys do? Because he does, he attends the meetings with the RPTA with all the parent booster groups in our building, so being able to attend the athletic ones would be great too. Got it. Thank you. I like giving Jack extra meetings. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot him already. <laughs> wow. Who's that? Anything else, Mr. Miley? No, I'm good. All right. 
Finance, audit, personnel, strategic plan, Mrs. Grassi. Uh, finance, audit, and personnel. We have not had a meeting since the last one. Um, I would anticipate we'll have one relatively shortly to review we'll, we'll the forecast information. Yeah, we'll probably have one in April and one in May, okay. is what I'm thinking. We had, we had just had one previous, uh, a month and a half ago, so. Um, and the strategic plan, I have no update because I haven't heard anything about it, so. We're kind of busy. <laughs> Anything else, Mr. Grassi? No. Nope. All right, buildings and grounds, alumni. So I'll just start with the alumni. I was out of town, so I was not able to attend that meeting. So uh, I'll have a report for you next week or next month. With regard to buildings and grounds, we actually have met a couple times. Uh, we met in, in person, uh, and, and we like to keep tabs on what's going on with the building. So we had a, a debrief from, from, uh, from, from Chris uh, regarding what was going on obviously it's been superseded by subsequent reports and we all heard what, what's going on all the good things going on at uh, Parkview and and uh, uh, Parkside and River Riverview um, the a uh, couple other things uh, Mr. Miley and I caught up with with uh, Mr. Wayner and we took a tour of the legacy uh, elementary buildings uh, Buckeye and, mm -hmm. and Melridge uh, as well as is Lamouth and we just wanted to get out and see what was going on and uh, based on our tour, where uh, Mr. Wayner is going to develop a plan to, to perhaps uh, increase the amount of custodial support that we have in those buildings, um, things are getting done, but they're they're not quite to the standard, frankly, is is what's happening here at the high school or even at Lamouth, which we we also toured. So we're going to see if we can't beef that up a little bit. Um, but it was a you know people are working hard and, and trying to get it done, but we just may need more support in, in those. Uh, in those schools. Can I ask a question about Buckeye Knowledge? Are where are we at as far as the ideas of the best wheels are trying to secure those buildings a little more? That's that Did was coming next. Up next. So so that's I'm gonna turn the floor over to, to Mr. Winter as well just to amplify some of the things I've said. But we did talk about the the uh, we saw some drawings uh, of potential uh, derivations of, of putting in the uh, you know the extra security uh, so that that's good and I'll turn over to Mr. Winter and then we also uh, I don't know if you Mr. Winter if you also have an update on the on the stands for the band yeah a couple things um, tomorrow at one o'clock with Mr. Kalis we're meeting with the company from CT to go over what we're thinking about for the band bleachers and we're also meeting with uh, Jeff Merritt uh, to come in for the, uh, the construction part of things and then hopefully after tomorrow's meeting, we agree on the bleachers. I can get them ordered, which is the, keeping me up at night whenever <laughs> you ask what keeps me up at night. Yep. Right now, man bleachers. He gets it too. Okay, <laughs> so we get those ordered. I'll feel a lot better about it. Um, we also uh, met with CT, um, and we're, we're talking to them about our vestibules. And this morning, and I haven't had a chance to talk to Mr. Kalis, um, I did get information this morning on air conditioning for the two uh, elementaries, and I held that number for Mr. Kalis whenever he's ready to see it. It just came in today. Um, we took a tour of Hale Road with an outside group, and we're going to go back again Friday with a, with a group to take them on a tour of Hale Road. We also went through Haddon. I'm sorry, is, is the, this group that you're doing on Friday, is that a separate group or just another group from the same organization? Yeah, I, I basically, yeah, he's, uh, a lot of what was said already has gone halfway into my uh, superintendent's room. <laughs> <laughs> we usually have some representatives from the uh, Lake County ESC walk through. Um, was it March 8th? And March 8th. They're coming come back this Friday. Come back uh, this Friday to take a look. Okay. Um, uh, to see if there's any use for the space. They didn't need to step on you. No, no, it's all right. No, yeah. These are band bleachers too. It, uh, we, we did get an estimate back of what it would be if the company went in itself and, 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 and created everything for us. Cool. Um, we think we can do some of it ourselves. Um, there's a difference between the type of bleachers that they uh, first quoted mm -hmm. us putting footers in and building out, off the, uh, out of the ground and uh, we're thinking that we might be able to put a concrete pad and put one that just sits on it. It's easier for maintenance that way, but we're going to compare the price. One's less expensive than the other. We might just go with the one that's less expensive. Mr. Wayne, where, where are the bleachers from uh, that we, that the students took down? 
that we have them at Concord, and they were, we had to cut them to remove them to pull them out of there. You're, trying to, you're at the maintenance building at Concord. Correct. Yeah. That we have them outside wrapped up and stored, and I also have so all. They're not usable anymore? I mean. Well, to have somebody come in and put them together, that's going to be a pretty big expense, but it's something that we could look at from a smaller standpoint of putting together for another group uh, for the baseball fields or whatever. That's something that probably could happen. Are those original, too, or no? Those are, as far as I know, yeah, they've been, they've been around. Bleachers. We dedicated the uh, stadium back in 02. Well, how much would new bleachers cost? What's, what's the we don't have a price on that yet. We're still looking at the exact replica of what was up for the band bleachers, plus a little extra space for growth in the band. Um, but we do have those dimensions. And that's something tomorrow that we're right going to. Right now, the estimate we received through an estimate uh, through CT Consultants. And this is very preliminary. It was $120,000 for the concrete pad, the stands, everything, uh, making a, a access road to get to the uh, the construction. And we're not we're not at that point yet. We we think we can do a lot of that work ourselves. We need the design, but we think we can do some of it on our own. So going for 20, 2019, what is the concession? Are they going to be where they were now? Or no, they're going to be. Um, they're going to be in the stands. Uh, the, no, they will be done hopefully by that time, but if you look at the, the, the stadium, kind of see it in the picture in the back, but the runoff of the 100 meter, it's kind of up on that uh, hill. It's, it's, I, I know you did this in the last meeting, if you could just turn the camera to the, the picture on the, on the wall. And it's, I think where Mr. Kalis is talking is, it's, it's the lower, yeah, he's gonna point it out, so. You went through this last meeting? It's in this vicinity here. We have to move a fence, put in a pad, and, and, and put the stands. We also have the, have the ability for the students to get out of the stands. So the stands that will be there will have some rows of egress. And then there'll be either um, some steps or a ramp to a smaller concrete pad to the, across the uh, track into the field. Mr. Boris, does this affect the football at all, putting them there? No. No. Actually, it, it, it enhances uh, some of the use that we have out of that field in that D section because we used to have the stands in that uh, turfed area behind the uh, back of the end zone there. And I do know that uh, we do have quite a bit of instruction going on, especially with the lineman and Coach Schuschler. Uh, but that's not the only reason. The other reason was we wanted to be able to have parents that are on the track team actually be able to watch their kids run because when those stands were in the that original spot at D section, you, you'd lose them behind there. You can't, you couldn't see the kids run, um, which caused a problem. I think this is a solution that I think everyone will be happy with, especially in the last couple of years when we put the, the rented stands in the other end by the concession. Um, it really obstructs the view of anyone that sta st used to stand around the fence. That was one of them. Um, you can't really see what's going on. It just doesn't look That's good. That's my spot. Wow, full course lots. <laughs> well, getting back to that again, I'm um, sorry. Uh, Mr. Boris, uh, I should ask you earlier, um, regarding uh, the football and track, uh, being that that's wide open now, uh, have we been able to entertain any type of playoffs or conference uh, meets at our new facility yet? We, well, with football and track specifically, you have to. Nothing with track yet, because we've, again, the first, I guess the best way to put it is we're just kind of all getting our feet wet and figuring out what we can with, you know, the track program, track coaches, and whatnot, but there is more. We've hosted the JV meet for the first time this year, and different things, we get some invitationals going, and so we're trying to be aggressive with that, yes. Football-wise, we applied for a playoff spot this year to host the state playoff game. Um, unfortunately, that often depends on geography of the two teams playing. So if we don't have um, two teams that this is kind of a central location for both, we wouldn't get selected. But we will continue to apply for those in the state. Uh, we did host the uh, girls soccer uh, playoff uh, match this year as well. Uh, not, not just our own, but I mean, um, an independent one. It was Madison and NDCL, I believe. So we were put in for all those to showcase our beautiful facilities. So okay. yeah, we're trying. Thank you. 
Well, it is a geography it was the issue too. There's nothing north of us, right? <laughs> and anything, uh, you know, Ashtabula teams uh, are to the east, but there's not um, a counterpart uh, really west of us from um, that will, will play uh, teams like Ashtabula. No, and it's they're true. Larger, they're larger schools. There's it some is. that are south. And if you put, and if Mayfield applies like they do, Metter applies like they do, you know, so now we're one of those three you know, vying for a spot. So it has to be a perfect storm. But we're going to keep trying. You know, we definitely want them here. Awesome. Mr. Chris, in your report, are you going to cover the dust fields? I can. I don't have them, but I, I can. Okay. I, I'll, I'll, right. Then I'll, I'll see that to, to Mr. Kalis. So I, I am done. <laughs> I'm done with my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hack. All right. Policy and legislative. Mr. Jeffries. Uh, under policy, uh, I have nothing new. Um, April 5th is in my report, too. This is your report, too. <laughs> <laughs> the first one we're meeting with the Neola rep. Okay. So, we'll so we will set up a that. meeting yeah. after that. Once it's, yeah, once it's, I yeah, contacted under the legislative, I contacted the OSBA, and there was nothing new really going on. Uh, legislatively, uh, but there was a state conference today in Columbus uh, where a lot of superintendents and school board members met and they were discussing the school funding and there might be something new coming down the pipe regarding uh, school funding. Hopefully it will be a relief for the community members and uh, uh, be more less money that they have to pay, pay out. Did you hear of anything? Yeah, I'll just give a little bit of update on the state budget and my report and okay. what the next steps are. So. That is all I have. All right, thank you. All right, well then, Mr. Kalis, I'll right. see you. Okay, I'm going to do the calendar last. Okay. Um, in talking to the construction uh, superintendent, um, demolition of Madison should occur during the month of July, also the cleanup. Um, parking lot will not be completed, nor will there be drop-off loops anywhere uh, at, at the site at Madison. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is I want to make sure that we get the word out to the parents over at Madison uh, that we would really encourage them to put their kids on the bus because there's not going to be um, a parking lot or a loop in there. When do they anticipate that? Probably done? around October is the target date. Hmm. Okay. And that, that, that was no change. That was all, always in the works that there's no way uh, they can uh, demolish the building, abate it, demolish it, and then have that all cleared by uh, August. And, and ready to roll. Um, so um, I've talked to Mrs. Shantry about it. She's going to get some um, notices out to the parents just to make sure that they understand that we prefer that they put their kids on the buses. Okay. Also, we also touched on the fact that we had ESC representatives uh, toward Haddon and Madison, or uh, Haddon and uh, Hale Road on March 8th. Um, they're looking for possible instructional space for alternative school and possibly the iSTEM school. iSTEM, uh, once we get notice, they have 60 days to let us know whether or not they're interested. Um, we'll work with them as well. Um, we're not, you know, they can they can waive the 60 day notice, but we have to wait 60 days for them to give us an answer on whether or not they're interested in the, in the uh, property. Um, currently, from what I understand, they're renting um, from Willoughby East Lake to the tune of about $80,000 a year. Um, I wanted to make sure that the board understood that I told the ESC representative that there's no way that we would be interested in retaining the property only to rent it out because we don't want to be responsible, number one, of keeping the property uh, when we told the public we were getting rid of them, mm -hmm. and uh, two, maintaining it because, you know, they want us to rent it to them. Um, so any um, type of deal that we would have with them would be to sell the property and, and, and do it that way. Um, we also had a, another a community member uh, reach out and was asking about the existing two buildings. This is the same individual that looked at Leroy uh, last spring, I think it was, it Gary? Was, it might have been last summer, yeah. I think it was. Um, and uh, Mr. Uh, Placco did uh, contact him back and, and updated him on that. Um, we also talked about the visioning uh, committee. That's going to be on April 4th. Um, right now, we have a list of many people, many stakeholders, including um, employees, community members, business people, um, representatives, of uh, uh, political representatives, and uh, we're trying to get as many people as we can to get together to try to find out what kind of building we may want or facility um, for this next phase. Do we have a sense of what time it's going to be and where? Uh, we, uh, we're we looking at the media center, I think, but we're not sure on that yet. depends on how many people are going to commit to it. 
And it's all day, isn't it? Well, uh, yeah. Melissa's thinking 7.30 to 2. Yeah, it's going to be a whole day. Uh, and then an alternative location uh, we're looking into is the his History Center. Right mm -hmm. We've been trying to align that so students could attend. Correct. We normally get representatives of high school students, middle school students, and others, so we wanted to align with the <coughs> Um, <coughs> I just wanted to congratulate uh, Raj Vagula, uh, I think it's the correct pronunciation. He not only won the Lake County um, Spelling Bee, he went on uh, and competed at Kirtland's uh, uh, Town Hall, and uh, he went to the Tri-County. There were three individuals there, and um, after 62 rounds, he came in second. Had he uh, won that, he would have gone to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to congratulate him for not only winning Lake County, but also coming in second after Track County. You want to add anything? No, I mean, he would, it was uh, down to the final two for like the last hour and a half. And him and the other student just, I would have been out in the fourth round. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty intense. It was, it was a long morning. It was, the other thing too I wanted to mention is the Senior Citizen Appreciation Day was really well attended. Okay. Um, I think, I, I, I mean, from what I remember, I think it's the largest crowd I think we've ever had. That's great. Yeah. And uh, the production of Newsies, cast and crew did a great job. And uh, also the kids uh, from the Foods class and, and Mrs. Snug who provided the dinner to our senior citizens. It was really nice. As always, the, the ground production was well done. You want to talk about the vestibules? Oh yeah. <laughs> also the vestibules. So uh, we we did receive um, some estimates back on each of the buildings. Um, I think they're uh, more detailed than what they need to be. Again, we're looking at trying to drive the cost down. But just to give the board an idea of what we're looking at is um, just putting uh, building a glass vestibule inside of uh, um, Buckeye, one where you would have to go to the once you're inside the building, you go to the glass to check in with the um, secretary, and you aren't able to get into the body of the, the building because there'll be a set of glass doors there. Again, that would probably be level three uh, glass as well, and also glass on the other side as well. Now, they gave us back um, an estimate that included moving some walls around. There needs to be a little bit of movement, a little construction, but not to the tune of what we saw. So we're, 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 the, the cost of that was, was really too high. So we're, we're looking at being more reasonable in what we want to do over there. It's quite simple, really, uh, to put the two glass. Melrose is a little bit different. Um, it's no easy way with the way that's designed and laid out. Um, but uh, while we went over there, there was we had uh, an idea of converting one of the first classrooms into a, an office area, which would allow um, somebody to come into the building uh, not through the main doors. And between where the main doors are, there's a staircase that goes upstairs. It would be the first classroom there to the right of those doors, which would allow somebody to walk in, a visitor, check in with this new area, and then go through another set of doors to get into the building. So with the way that we've got the new um, redistricting set up, would you be able to lose that classroom and be okay I, I believe we can. I believe you can. We're looking at the other office area could be for meetings and some intern um, offices. Yeah. I, um, again, I think there's a lot to be said for some of the work that our maintenance can do mm -hmm. over um, contracting out. So uh, we're working on that now, looking at what we can do. Okay. All right. So I have three uh, sets of calendars here. Let me have one, two. Thank you. In talking with uh, ICON, uh, they're a little behind in the schedule, and we were talking about what could be a possible start date, and um, it can be anywhere between the end of August or the first day after uh, Labor Day. What you're looking at uh, represents moving some uh, professional development days and uh, a couple of days of flexibility in terms of when we start and when we end. Everything in the middle is relatively the same. Um, if you look at uh, graph number one, the three blue sections in August would be uh, teacher and service and teacher work days for us. And the kids would start on the 29th and 30th. 
We would have uh, September 2nd off. And um, if you look throughout again, if you go to November, you're going to see that on the 5th. That day would not be just a day off for everyone because election day. Instead, we would have the teachers come in because the teachers have a certain obligation of days they have to, to be here. Um, November's around Thanksgiving would remain the same. Christmas would remain the same, that winter break. As you can see, there's some question about taking off some days at the end of it, but the way the first, second, and third of January falls, we didn't want to have the kids come back on Friday the third. We would think that had we done that, that wouldn't look very reasonable. Um, so uh, the 17th uh, would be another professional development day. The 20th, the kids would have off for Martin Luther King Day. February um, the 17th would be uh, President's Day. Again, the end of March would be um, the first, last full week of March would be our uh, spring break. April, uh, we'd have Good Friday off, which would be the 10th, and then uh, Holy Monday, uh, Easter Monday, the 13th. And uh, the students would be done on uh, June the 5th, and then we would have two um, professional development days. Uh, one would be a work day as well on uh, the 8th and 9th. So with this schedule, this calendar, kids would start on the 29th and they would get out on the 5th. The only problem is a lot of our professional development days would be stacked in the beginning of the year and also at the end. We'd have two uh, professional developments in between. Now I value professional development, but I don't think it's gonna be very valuable if we're doing some professional development kinda at the end of the year. Because you have three months of, of losing whatever it is that we're, we're doing out. If we go to the second draft, we have two days. Um, the 27th and 28th would be teacher report days. Students would again would start on the 29th. And the calendar kind of remains the same, but we have more professional development in the uh, course of the year. And the students would get out on Tuesday the 9th, and teachers would be done on their work day on uh, June 10th, a day later. All the rest remain the same. The reason why it's pushed back a little bit farther is the fact that we have more professional development days in the body of this calendar, which would mean that the students aren't going uh, to those days, and we have to tack them on at the end of the year. Draft three. We have three days, uh, 28th, 29th, and 30th. This is the calendar which would have the kids go back on uh, the third, which is the first day after uh, Labor Day like it used to be when we were kids. And uh, again, the days, uh, professional uh, development days would be two really in the body of the calendar. And uh, there'd be two days at the end of the year and June 10th and 11th. And the students would be required to be here into the second week of June on the 9th. Based on one the buildings, What's that? Go online. Like, how how soon do we have to vote on a calendar? <coughs> how soon do we have to vote on a calendar? Like, how long can we prolong the voting? You on can a calendar? look at these. I mean, I, I can bring it to the board in uh, April. Uh, I do have to contractually speak, and I have to share it with the union as well. Um, <coughs> either one of these three, I think, would work. It's just you know, professional development days is, is one thing we need to consider, um, and also. Um, you know, how late do we want to go into June? And it'll only be for one year or two. I mean, it's not, it's not going to be something that's going to be set in stone. Right. But these are, we, we can tweak some things, but these are three are, are, are good representatives of what we think we can do. And it will work. I mean, the ICON would like to have uh, a start after Labor Day. Um, but they also said that, you know, we're the owner and we could set it up for the 29th. They just want to make sure they have occupancy uh, license or certificates. Um, and that it doesn't only include one, it includes things like plumbing, uh, it also includes uh, fire. You know, we just need to have all these entities come through and make sure that the building is up and running and ready uh, for the kids to be in it. So which calendar do you prefer? I, I can go with the, any one of the three. Um, I would prefer starting on the 29th if, if we can, but um, you know, if they're not 100% ready on the 29th, then <laughs> I'll have wished we would have taken the third. <laughs> You're talking about two days, though. I mean, yeah, really. So, you know, why, why the 29th? 
Just um, because uh, a couple of the original calendars we had, the kids were getting out by the third week of uh, of uh, June. And I think that's too late. You know, a lot of other schools are already starting two or three weeks before us. Um, we'll have a couple of ball games already under our belt. Auburn kids are going to have to start when they when Auburn's ready, not when they're ready. Um, I don't want them to start after Labor Day. Um, they have certificates they have to get, and they have to have a certain number of contact hours. So um, my suggestion would be, no matter what um, calendar we have, that we send our Auburn kids to Auburn when, in the middle of August. A lot of other districts are starting their um, year uh, in the week of the 12th of August. So further we push back, I know, I, I, don't, I don't agree with it. I think it's, I, I don't know why they do that. If you have air conditioning, okay, maybe. We don't. It's so early. We will with the two elementary schools. But right, but not here. So the 29th gives us a couple of days. I don't, I don't want to start them on a Friday where they're only coming in one day. But just kind of get your feet wet, and then you start the, the uh, week um, on Tuesday, the 3rd of September. Are they having all day sure. kindergarten? Are kindergartners going to start on the same day as everyone no, else? No, they can start, start a few days. Yeah, they start three days later. Right, right. I just didn't know if that was going to be any different. Same thing with preschool. On the third calendar, Chuck, is there any reason why we can't move the 11th um, to the 27th of August? No, it's an option, too. I mean, they could do it. Have four days. And then you got more front end school year stuff going on? Yeah. And then. Could be. We, we had one where there were four days in a row. We took it out just because we thought it was just overloading those all the days. For the teachers doing at that time. The reason I like the third, though, is because that does give Icon more time if it's a rush, and it also gives us more time if we're moving, um, depending on where the buildings are. I, I think that no matter what time we give them, they'll take. That's the thing, you know. It'd be nice to be at, you know, we, our target date was August 1st. And we're pushing up what they say three, four weeks right now. So well, it's already that. bad enough that we can't even get in a driveway at a yeah. building. So <laughs> I just think that if if something happens that we can't make the 29th, you're going to scramble and tell everybody <coughs> we're not doing it. Hopefully, we'd know beforehand. Well, even if it's a week. <laughs> You're going to still scramble and tell everybody after they set up their babysitting well, we, and everything else? Yeah, well, we do that for calamity days. It's the night before. So it's just where we probably take a little bit of a black eye because, you know, we weren't ready on the time that we said we would be. But, I mean, a reasonable per person would think, you know, that sometimes these things happen. I mean, we're fortunate enough to have two new buildings. And, uh, you know, I, I, it doesn't matter to me either way. Uh, so it'd be safe. 20, 20, it'd be safe. Number three, uh, starting after Labor Day. Would be, but again, it's again, it's starting a lot later than everyone else around us. Again, we got the Auburn. We got uh, we got a couple of things going on. Kids are going to be practicing there and everything else. Well, Auburn and uh, Lakeland kids, and probably even Erie kids are all going to start before the rest of the kids, and those are the big kids, so they can handle that. Yeah. <coughs> I have, you know, we can potter and, and perhaps vote in, in April, but uh, I guess my, my inclination would be the uh, draft three, which is starting on, on September 3rd, just for the reasons that Mr. Miley kind of outlined. And I understand your, your points, but um, if you can live with any of them, then that seems yeah. to give us the most flexibility and, and safety margin of error, I guess. Plus, the nice thing is if, if the buildings are done, I'm sure we're going to want to have a kickoff. We can have those kickoffs on the on those days. Yeah, we were thinking 28 or 29. Yeah, we were thinking of having them in an open house, having right. a combination of both. Because yeah. we're not going to be able to get in. I don't think any earlier than well, if, we, if we tell them the third. I'm telling you, it'll be the third. If we tell them the 29, it'll be the 29. Well, if you're that sure, then good luck. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, there we. Just to, to the point of you know what what variables are out there, I, you know I've asked many times if there are any issues with, with vendors and supplies and things like that, and you know we're over the bad weather, so the veneer can go up, 
there doesn't seem to be any issue with with vendors, but but you just you just never know. So those are the dependencies I see. We don't see an issue with labor force or, or things like that. So more or less, we have a kind of a clean glide path. But but you know, I, it's it's it does create a more margin of error going on the third. It would only be one year. So by hearing the board's leaning towards having this start on third? I mean, I've already I, expressed this, so I don't know where Mr. Uh, I like is. version one better, but I, will, I don't care that deeply about it either way. I just like them ending on that Friday the 5th, mm -hmm. honestly a little more than ending all the way into June 9th. But I can go either way. Like I said, I, I like the third draft number three. Uh, this, like the with there, uh, but we won't have any problems in the starting third. Also, uh, really if you start earlier, it's, it's normally a lot hotter. So the kids would be in school in air during heat time. We mm -hmm. might not have a school because so of the heat. Didn't we go back to school on the second one year recently? Several years. Second of September? No, on the second of January, like after spring. spring I know, March. I would ask that the one day. Like I don't know why we can't start on the second. But then again, it's your choice. Well, not you, January 2nd and 3rd, you'd pick up the two days. That would still get you out the 5th on the 3rd calendar. So that's not a bad thing. Well, and the other thing I had asked Jim when he and I were talking about this the other day, too, is if we put spring break back the way it used to be and pick up a day instead of having e that Easter Monday off, making spring break the way it used to be when it followed yeah, Easter. Yeah, and you, could, and you could do that to save a day. You know, are there other creative ways we can? Yeah, that's and that's not that late because we've had later spring, spring breaks. Right. Uh, yeah. Over my career, so. Oh yeah. A lot of schools are going. They, they because parents didn't like it. Well, I agree, but we're talking about just this year. I mean, that that's I totally agree that we had talked about always mm -hmm. going last week in March. But I'm just saying, if we can pluck a few days here and there to get the kids. <clears throat> Out do on the fifth. Right, do the start after Labor Day, but get them out still that first week of June. Yeah. I'd be much happier yeah. with that. Yeah. yeah, that's even a better thought. It's good. So especially knowing that it's just this year. Right. We have though communicated to families already and I mean personally myself as well that we has, we are now doing spring break the third week in March. So right, but that's that not a we didn't vote on that. It's not saying, a hard I get that because people have asked me too, but it's not a hard and fast rule. Because that's what we have, we moved to to towards the district. We did, but that's Yeah, not but this is an exceptional year. It is. This is we want grand openings of some nice castles. <laughs> okay. So people need to be understanding this year of that. I would just ask him maybe we can see if how we can pluck a few days here and there yeah, and, and make it so we start three. at the third but still end on the end the fifth. <coughs> Whether it means alternate changing spring break or it means us going back on it's January second. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, just looking at going back on January second, I always you know when we were in school had the two full weeks coming back after that <coughs> it was a little a little groggy, I guess is what I would say, trying to get back into the school swing of things and having two days that week, I think, would help. Plus, the weekend right there would would help, perhaps, put one in a in a better mindset. To just go two days, you mean, and then yeah. have a weekend versus coming back at five. Yeah, I agree. So that might, you know, mm -hmm. parents might actually be excited to send their kids back to school on January second. Right? Isn't there a Christmas song about that? Something <laughs> to that effect. There are the national championships on Monday, anyhow, the seventh. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll take a look at it again. You know, whatever we come up with, I'll stop, send it to the board. Because yeah. yeah. I agree, it would be optimum if they got out on the face. That would be kind of a, a nice way to bring out the year. Okay. Okay. Thank, you report. Thank you. Mr. Platko. Okay, I uh, wanted to give the state budget update on uh, March 15th. Governor DeWine introduced his uh, new state budget proposal. The school funding formula basically stays the same, the same dollar allocation that we get now. 
Um, without it increasing, that's actually kind of helps us because it doesn't increase the charter school deductions and things like that. But what also, on top of that, he did put in additional funding uh, for uh, earmarked for things like mental health counseling, wraparound services, mentoring, and after school programs. Uh, distribution is based on uh, census poverty data, and for people, dollar amounts range on a sliding scale from $20 a student to $250 per student in fiscal year 2020 and then from $25 a student to $300 a student in 2021. Uh, they had a little projection of what kind of, this is in addition to the formula, so it's not subject to any type of cap or guarantee or any type of reduction for state share index and all that funky stuff that happens with the state formula. This is totally separate of that, so there's nothing that affects this number other than our uh, poverty census data. So Riverside, based on our enrollment, and uh, we would get 47, dollars and 66 cents per student in FY20 that'd be $184,000 uh, comparing to other districts like Painesville City they get the maximum 250 per student so they get 694,000 and that district uh, like Mentor is pretty comparable to us they're $45.91 so a little bit less per student but they have a higher enrollment obviously so they're around 344,000 so that's in the governor's proposal um, it could change drastically by the time it gets a, whenever the final budget's approved in the end of June this year. Uh, what happens next is it goes to the House. The House will have their budget proposal and the Senate will have their budget proposal as, as we go through the process over the next few months. Um, I know I mentioned previously I went to that Cup Patterson, the two representatives Cup and Patterson are putting together a new state funding formula. Uh, that was not included in anything in DeWine's proposal. I'm not sure if that's going to be what the House is going to propose going forward or if they're going to go status quo for now and introduce the new formula in two years. That's yet to be seen. Uh, they have another uh, another meeting, some meetings come up in the beginning of April to kind of go over where they're at with that. I'm hoping to try to attend one of them, but the one that's closest to us, I have a conflict that day uh, and a couple other conflicts in other days. I might have to drive to Northwest Ohio to their meeting over there on the first, but I'll wait and see if I can try to move some things around. And see, we get uh, maybe an update on that. So that's the first proposal that could change drastically, but it's good to monitor as we go on and you know see what could be happening or could not be happening. Uh, next up, I just wanted to go through a, a PowerPoint about the Lake County School Financing District. On tonight's agenda, we have the first resolution of necessity to put the renewal up on this November. This is the joint levy with the three other school districts. I'll kind of go through the details of that just so we know kind of refresh on what it is and because and, it's a little unique because I think it's still the only school financing district in Ohio that I'm aware of. Uh, recently there's been some attempts at doing a safety one or one for special education and those were not, were not successful. Uh, the Lake County School Financing District has been around for, for many years. <coughs> I don't think this is working because it's not on. There we go. So levy purpose and background. So the resolution was adopted on February 6, 1990 that created the school financing district known as the Lake County Schools Financing District for the purpose of levying taxes for the provision of the following specified educational programs and services by the school districts that are part of the <coughs> district. That includes personnel, materials, supplies, and transportation for instruction in language arts, social studies, mathematics, fine and practical arts, health and physical education, and science and business education. I always think, when I see 1990, I still think it's 10 years ago, but it's almost 30 years at this point. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> the four districts that are involved, Madison Local School District, Painesville City Local School District, Perry Local School District, and of course Riverside. If you ever wonder why Painesville is called Painesville City Local, because usually you're only a city or a local school district, and that's because they were required to be a local school district to be in a financing district. So that's how they changed their name you know, years ago, so they can be part of the financing district, and that's why it's a... Uh, the weird city local school district. <coughs> so. uh, passage vote and passage history. Uh, the first attempt in August of seventh, nineteen ninety, uh, was unsuccessful when it was first introduced, and then in November of nineteen ninety, had passed at sixty three point six six percent, and then was renewed again in ninety five, two thousand, two thousand five, two thousand ten, and two thousand fifteen. Uh, historically, has passed a, a pretty good margin when you compare it to other school levies. And it currently goes through tax year 2019, collection year 2020 is you know you pay your property taxes one year after the, the taxing year. So collection on that would go through calendar year 2020. 
of the current levy that's in place. So how does Riverside use the funds? All the funds are accounted for in a separate fund, which is Fund 30. Uh, they're not included, the, the funds are included in our five-year forecast. Interesting enough, the other three districts do not include them in their plan, in their five-year forecast. Uh, we treat them as operating funds. I mean, that's what they're for. They're for instruction, so that's why we included them. And one of the other treasurers of the other districts said, we probably should be doing it that way, but the law requires general fund, and then we have the financing in there. I think it's important to have it in there because it's really operating funds. It's not like something special like a, a pre-FPI levy or a construction levy. We use the funds uh, just for teacher salaries only, uh, for teachers that are on the Riverside campus. Uh, right now they're funding about 32 teachers through that levy in the English, math, science, and social studies. We don't charge any of the benefits to that fund. We don't do the materials, supplies, or transportation expenses. I mean, obviously there's only limited funds and keeping it simple, just doing the salaries to that fund. And that's kind of how we've always handled it. So as I said before, uh, right now, looking at the current tax rate, looking at tax year 2018, collection year 2019, this is what the millage is currently. The voting millage was 4.9 mills back in 1990. And as you know, as valuations go up, tax rates come down uh, due to House Bill 920. So the residential tax rate is only 2.28 mills. <coughs> technically, it's 2.277721. Uh, so the cost right now for $100,000 home value to $100,000 is $69.76. And this reflects the 10% rollback that the state pays on, on, the, on the homeowners, uh, pays for them, you know, and then the 2.5% owner occupied credit as well. For class two commercial industrial and class three public utility tangible, both of those collection rates are still at the 4.9 mills. Public utility always stays at, at the full millage, but commercial has stayed there because the valuations have not really increased much over the years. This is kind of a little bit harder to see. But it shows the different valuations over the last uh, 10 years, class one being residential, uh, class two being commercial, and class three being public utility. Because everyone always says, well, you know, the levies because of the power plant. But as you can see, a lot of, you know, 75% of the valuation is made up by residential homeowners. And then public utilities was much smaller. But the history on here kind of shows in the third set of numbers, the valuation you see the devaluations from the power plant, 15% in tax year 17, 18% in tax year, uh, in tax year 18. So that those valuations have been dropping as the power plant's been kind of winding down and going towards a potential <coughs> in the next couple of years. But we're waiting to hear more on what might happen with that. Uh, some of some annual revenue history here. This is based on fiscal year. And you can see in 2009, we're getting about 2.7 million. And it's slowly been declining every year through 2018 and that's due to the variables of enrollment and valuations is how things have, have fallen over the past couple of years so you see a 10-year change we've, we're down about 18 percent in revenue from where we were about 10 years ago on that so the, the current allocation of how the funds are distributed uh, it's class one and class two revenues so your residential and commercial revenue is based on each district's enrollment so Rather than being distributed based on your evaluation, it's going on enrollment. So as enrollment changes among the four districts, the allocation kind of changes around. Class three is distributed based on two-thirds portion of the enrollment and one-third based on each evaluation. That was a change that was made uh, years ago just to kind of help uh, Perry uh, maintain some of the revenue from the power plan. With the renewal, we're looking at changing the allocation, of, which would be for tax year 2020, collection year 2021 and that each district will basically receive their proportionate share of the levy from based on their valuation. Uh, right now for Riverside, if you looked at actual data from 2000 tax year 17, collection year 18, we would have, would have received based on the new formula 2.7 million, where we actually received 2.1 million. Uh, you know, over the years, if we renewed the levies, we were getting tangible personal property reimbursements, we were getting uh, some of the deregulation money that's now going away. All that stuff has been phased out quickly over the last couple of years. So we were getting dollar for dollar a few years ago, but now is progressively going against us in our favor, you know, not in our favor, but against us. And that's why we need to have this allocation change that we've, the four districts have met. We've discussed that. We've all come to an agreement on, and we'll have a resolution for that at some point in the near future to change the allocation for the new levy. 
doing this new allocation also protect Riverside, Painesville, and Madison from the future Perry Power Plant devaluation. So it's basically be all in Perry's court on that. And then it also protects all the districts from disproportionate changes in enrollment because of everything's based on enrollment. So if one district's going up and one's going down, their funds are shifting and your, your funding's based on the other three districts' enrollment as well. So that's how things have kind of gotten a little out of whack over the last few years. So why doesn't Riverside just say, forget the financing district and let's go out for our own levy? Well, the first point is the new levy would not receive the 10% rollback and the 2.5% owner-occupied credit. Those were only made in 2013 and all new levies. Uh, and then a result, and if you remember from the previous slides, we have the lower tax <coughs> rate for residential and 4.9 for commercial and residential. Well, if we pass a new levy to replace it, then all three classes would be on a level be on the same millage at that point. So basically, the the, sh the shift of the, the taxes, you know, residential won't be saving anything. It's all going to be commercial and public utilities without a new levy. So right now they're paying at a much higher rate, but they're they would see all the savings and not the residential tax payer. And also, if we wanted to just replace the current revenue that we're receiving from the financing district, we have to pass a 2.03 mil levy, is what we've estimated. Now remember, we're currently at 2.27. But because the new levy would not receive that 10% rollback and that 2.5% uh, owner occupied credit, it would actually cost the residential taxpayer an extra dollar twenty nine a year to pass that lower millage levy to receive the same amount of revenue. Where if we kept it where it's at now and changed the allocation, we'd have that increase in revenue as opposed to keeping the <coughs> revenue as, as it is. So basically it would increase the cost of the taxpayer and we would lose out on all the increase we received from the reallocation and this uh, some frequently asked questions usually this goes out with when the levy goes out but uh, is this a renewal levy yes it's a renewal levy based on you know it's been around for 25 almost 30 years at this point uh, will it increase taxes no the renewal will just keep this at the same millage We're currently at 2.28 mills and will it be permanent or continuous no it'd be for a five-year period so just a, a question the legal basis for putting together the the joint financing district was to take advantage overall of the the valuation of the Perry nuclear power plant right i think that was a part of it yeah they, yeah so if, if that does end up being mothballed does that take away the legal basis for for what we're doing no because it's still it, in, in a nutshell it's still just the levy of the four school districts combined you know Obviously, the point was to reallocate the funds from the power plant to that, but that's not, there's no legal behind that other than the agreement amongst the four districts that had agreed to that, you know, the way that the funds are allocated. So basically, changing an allocation to based on valuations, we just had to have a new agreement that all four districts agree to to do that change. Okay. That makes any sense. Okay. Thank you. Does that agreement have to be done before the levy, or can it be done any time? I'm believe, just curious. I believe it can be done any time. Because we're not the um, collecting agent. Right. The, the Lake County ESC is currently the, the collecting tax on district that collects the funds and then they distribute it based on the agreement. Uh, we have a meeting on April 3rd with the four districts to kind of go over the new allocation, make sure we're on the same page, and make sure it's, you know, that uh, the legal counsel square patent bonds on this, that they put it in writing exactly how we envision it to, to be going forward. Any other questions on that? And good work. Thank you. That concludes my report. All right. That takes us to public participation. Anyone wishing to address the Board of Education will be recognized by the Board President. Speakers are requested to identify themselves and their topic comments are limited to three minutes. If anyone has anything? All right. Moving along then, the Consent Agenda. The consent Agenda provides for a more efficient use of time. Any board member can remove a consent agenda item to be discussed and voted on individually. First up is finance and audit. Uh, we have a motion to approve the items listed on finance and audit. Consent agenda is recommended by the treasurer items A through J. Uh, before we go, go into that, I would like to uh, have a discussion on quite a bit of Do we, can we have that before I say remove? Well, let's have a second and then we'll discuss okay. um, if we want to separate anything. Okay, I'll second it. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Second. Mr. Miley did. 
under uh, item C, the verse, uh, we have Mr. Douglas here. Uh, he's been on, on, on our staff now for three years. Uh, what changes are, what have you noticed or with him? He, he's done a lot of uh, interactive work with our students. Um, he's done some work with our um, staff. Um, he's also helped us with conflict resolution and certain extreme cases where we um, could use his um, expertise with some parents. Um, Mr. Uh, Douglas uh, program that is different than some of the other programs that we have. There's a sustainability to his program. He's always available to us. Um, he, uh, you know, in the past, uh, and I, I don't have the, the number of times, but we've been in, in on the, um, we've been investigated a few times in terms of the Office of Civil Rights. We've always came out on the good side of that. But as in any other district, I mean, we could do some things uh, better. Um, he's also used as a sounding board. He gives us some direction in terms of what we need uh, in our district and how to achieve uh, diversity. Um, he's also uh, helping us plan a program for next year where we're going to get our athletic um, leagues, our athletic league and our uh, teams uh, together. Um, there's uh, a little bit of dissension uh, amongst um, our teams playing uh, other groups uh, in our in our league and uh, we're trying to put together a, a program where each district will host um, some training with um, our captains of our athletic uh, teams and we'll go and uh, each month it'll be at a different uh, place um, doing team building um, interacting with other players in, in uh, we don't have to pay the other uh, schools in our, our league um, he, he has like a lot of good ideas in terms of um, uh, the diversity piece ever since he's been here we haven't had I don't believe um, any major complaints in the Office of Civil Rights as well okay. um, he, he's just a great resource to have and for the amount of, of uh, money it costs to have him here it's money well spent in my book this is different than the what we're paying in for to do the culture playbook and well, right? Like know, this is is this wrapped up all in one thing? Yeah. What what you'll notice, I think the contract we had before was up through January. He's been working with us since January, but the the contract he gave us is from March to the end of the year. So there's a couple months in there that I'm sure it's covered in the contract, but it's that, that, that in terms of the dates. He, he's been. He, I know he's working with us because we had him in on a meeting um, earlier. Uh, I think it was in February. So, are the teachers? Uh, is our staff implementing any of the changes or ideals that he's coming up with? They are. It's more about awareness too, and, and about um, our district being pretty eclectic. We have some really wealthy areas, and we also have some poverty areas. It only. It, it isn't only uh, an issue of, of race, but it's also an issue of economics and uh, what we can do to, to try to catch kids that are falling through the cracks. A couple of years ago when we were talking about gap closing, it was more or less what we believed is, is some kids that are just, they're not, they don't qualify for special education, um, they don't, um, they're, they're kids that aren't academically engaged. We want to be able to provide for them um, just an extra layer of, of awareness to, to their situations. Um, I, I don't know, I mean, we, we, we've had we've had some interaction also with the kids role playing, mm -hmm. the Project Mosaic. Um, he did uh, some work at a PD, all day PD out at the Paradigm Center. It's very well received by our staff. That's what I was just gonna say. Okay. Really that a lot. Am I missing anything? No, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to put it in right. a hand. I mean, just it's it's so. it's his ability to. So I, I, my my problem with this is our our, our growth is in in our minority students and and, and there's no growth in in our minority staff uh, that what we do have here at Riverside. Um, I don't know if our teachers already have understand what he's doing I don't know why we have to keep him on staff I, I mean just because 
there's no policy saying that we have to, is that correct? Right, but it's it's one of those things where we want to get better, we can do better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we may not have a, a, a diverse uh, population really here, but we do have, I think, 3% three per, three African American, I believe about 10% uh, Hispanic. Um, we need to be able to uh, work with all, all kinds of kids coming from all kinds of backgrounds. It includes uh, um, white, white kids as well. There are some kids that are, are struggling with poverty. Um, he, he's just, he's bringing up, like I said, it's, uh, it's like a level of awareness in, in how to help some of these kids not fall through the cracks. Yeah, I mean, I think if you guys are seeing the benefits to it and you find it to be important, I think it's important that we continue with him. Melissa has been working with him uh, mm -hmm. in the PD aspect. I'm sure if she was here, she would probably give a better explanation than I can. I, I work, mm -hmm. I've, I've worked with him as well, um, but in terms of developing the program, she's the one that really works. And I, have to, I have to remind the board that we haven't been hiring. Yeah. Right. We've reduced. I don't want to give. He can help us with that too when the time comes. So if you know, always reducing when the time comes where we can start to uh, uh, try to diversify our staff as well. He, you know, so long as I, you know we're talking quality applicants and everything else, he can help us uh, in that respect too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Well, let's continue down. Uh, item F. Um, Diane Phillips. Um, here it says we're going to um, give her another 25 days. What, what was her position before she was a consultant? She was in. She was in the same position. We changed her responsibilities um, this year due to she no longer does functional behavior assessments and behavior intervention plans because we hired one of our teachers into that role. And originally she was hired by the year. We hired and I was going to speak to that. So originally I do believe this is the most cost effective way to get the services that we that we received from Diane because um, when she was with the ESC her per diem rate was higher and we were also paying benefits and the cost of doing business. So based on this we went and now we contracted with her as an independent contractor the overall per diem rate is is less and we are no longer paying the extras in terms of the benefits and the cost of doing business. So the she the services that she I mean when she was here full time her her uh, what was her uh, status there she was was she director of uh, special she previously was the director of student services when she was full time did she have a consultant working with her at the time she, she's more she functions more as a district representative in IEP meetings for students that are placed outside the district as well as students that are in our district um, within our population of students who have social emotional and behavioral difficulties and that has been her role because we changed her role a little bit and she had less of the responsibility of the functional behavior assessments and, and developing behavior, behavior plans with teams we, we really kind of hmm. guesstimated in terms of the number of days we were going to need yeah. her i think the original was uh two days a week it was 75 days total more. for the school year um however our population amongst our um uh, social emotional behavioral students it, it's doubled right we don't want to bring a resolution to the board where it's it's more than what we need mm -hmm. um, right so we can rework uh, so the language of a, of, a, of a resolution saying okay. no more than this amount of days and as long as so it's approved by the board we can I was trying to be conservative in that we thought 75 days was going to be enough to cover but we fell short because of the increase in the number of students um, you know, that have moved into the district, and then we have a number of students out of the district that we are still responsible for the implementation of their IEPs, even though they're open enrolled to another public school district. So a representative has to attend those meetings from Riverside. What one of the other advantages of having Diane, too, is because she worked in the, the district so long, she's developed relationships with a lot of these families too. and that's so very a, critical especially with the population face. of students that she works with so can i ask so, a, just a general question because I, I really don't have a problem with this because i really don't want to interrupt service for the current year but can we look at a different um <clears throat> maybe a different plan for next year perhaps like just so that we can have some options 
um, like if we're going to take the amount of money that she would get paid, for example, you need another 100 days, for example, you might be able to hire a full-time staff person. But I guess that's what we did, Belinda. I mean, <coughs> what we did was we looked at when we changed her from an ESC employee to an independent contractor, that's exactly what we did. We looked at how are we going to get the same service, which is most cost-effective for the district. I don't believe that we would find, especially given, like like we said, her experience and the relationships she has established with these families. I mean, there's something to be gained from that. I do believe this is really cost effective for us when you look at other supervisors in these types of positions, whether they're district employees or hired through an ESC. The overall cost is going to be a lot more. So she's at a supervisor level. Well, much longer she she's is. Okay. Anyway, right. Right. Well, one thing we can well, ask, that's the other thing. we right. can I ask mean, going going forward is for next year looking at different options one hiring another person full-time for close to the same amount of money Two, looking at PSI see if they have anybody that can come in at a cheaper rate and three looking at what Diane's charging us per hour because the one thing that we can do with Diane in my opinion is we can control kind of control to a point how much she charges per day um, right but this is less than what we were paying as an ESC employee. I understand that yeah, I heard we you we would pay if she was a full-time supervisor mm -hmm. hired by the I district. understand that but okay. maybe some of these other options might be a cheaper rate and more time so that makes, I mean, I think that's why we want you to look at it at the end of the year we say this just See what's more well, cost effective. I, that, that, that's great when you're looking at just dollars too. But again, we we, we get some other uh, value out of having Diane because she's got these relationships with the. With the I mean, I guess when I contract with an individual, whether it be an agency or an individual, I'm always looking for what's the most cost effective way to get the service that we need. I mean, honestly, if you want me to explore a five day a week person, but I don't need a five day a week person to do the responsibilities that she covers. I need somebody between 75 and 100 days a year to do what, what she does in terms of the services she provides to the district. But can a full-time person provide extra services to us? Other areas that we may need some more supervision or some more help. I mean, let's be honest, if we're paying somebody a, 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 another $20,000 and getting a whole school year out of them, I, I find I find that as well, I estimated it. I'm not. I'm just guessing. I don't yeah, know. Well, it would probably be double. It well, would be double. Because you had to pay. Yeah, yeah it would be about eighty something. Consultants. We don't pay health care. We don't right. pay Medicare tax. We don't pay workers comp type of thing. So if you have a full time employee, if their salary it says sixty nine, you, you start know, 40, out and say we got somebody yeah. at the bottom. Yeah. Well, yeah. starting right. at that level, sixty nine. My point is the reason why that I'm questioning this is it seemed like a lot of districts do this. The, the, well, would they rehire so administrators back, but they don't rehire teachers right. back. Yes. I mean, it should be fair both ways across the board. We, yeah, and, we've and offered before. We, uh, there was a music yeah. teacher a few years back that was retired. We offered to have them back. But no, I mean, philosophically speaking, I know the, uh, at least the boards that I've dealt with in, in this district have not been keen on retire rehires either. This is also someone, though, with very specialized. That is what is to be gained from hiring, especially a supervisor or somebody into an administrative position that already has the experience, the knowledge base, knows the district, has worked with the families that she's worked with. There is something to be gained by that. Um, she does have some flexibility in her schedule, I mean, and can adjust accordingly. It's very difficult to find a part-time person, quite honestly, with that type of experience, knowledge base, et cetera, who only wants to work two days a week or two and a half days a week, what have you. And, and there are other districts, neighboring districts, that have supervisors that are retire rehires, and I did double check, and yeah. they're paying even more. So, you know, hiring them through the district directly. Again, I, I do feel that we have found a way to provide the service that's most cost effective to the district. So, I think the point is right now. You need the 25 more days, and that's what we're yeah. voting on. We're not voting on what we're doing next Correct. year. The vote is on 25 more days to get us through the end of the school year. Okay. But asking that if you can just sure. at least come to the board with something to show us that it is the most cost-effective way sure. for next year. Mm -hmm. Right? Good. That's what everyone yep. needs? Yes. Okay. Um, Thank you. Let's go to the next one, Chromebooks. 
<laughs> I can't help it. We uh, want to go home tonight. We're, 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 we're supposed to be here. I'm worried about the finances. 1,500 1, new Chromebooks. Uh, I believe it was in 2016, we had two batches, large batches of Chromebooks come, and we financed those. Uh, those two and that was less than four years and now we're looking at 1500 what is the, are, are they that bad uh, can you yeah, answer I got a little bit of research on this to make sure we had some information um, and first I want to clarify we wrote the resolution the way it is to authorize the purchase of up to 1500 1500 Chromebooks at that cost um, what it is we have we're getting three quotes uh, for different amounts of one, either 1,000, 1,200, or 1,500 Chromebooks, and uh, we didn't, we, we only received one of the quotes in before today's board meeting. And actually, I just got the second one, maybe 30 minutes before the board meeting started. Um, so we wrote it this way because we always have to have three quotes per board policy, and it's obvious good practice. But we didn't want to wait till the next board meeting on April 29th to ensure that we can order these in time to. In, you know, time for next school year. Uh, as far as where the amounts came from, uh, we we're looking at replacing the classes of 2022 and 2025. Uh, so that's about seven, eight hundred in those two classes. There, we did purchase just on a historical. Uh, you know, as far as we did purchase 715 Chromebooks in 2014, uh, 1140 Chromebooks in 2015 and 1455 in 2016 because we're one to one right now from grades 6 through 12 that's about 2500 or so and then at the elementary level we have class sets throughout the six elementary buildings i'm not sure the exact count uh netops is working on that inventory to see where we're at and making sure that for the elementary schools for next year we have an appropriate number of chromebooks across the district wide with, with the new buildings and the old buildings and make sure that everything <coughs> equal across the curriculum across the district. So, so that's the class of 2025, were they using Chromebooks that were used already? Because class of 2022 are the current freshmen. Yeah. So class of 2025, you're talking about the, the kids that are going to be like coming into so the, the... Going into sixth grade, I believe. Is, if you, no, it's 2026, because that's my youngest. So that's the it current, current sixth graders. But I mean, so I'm just curious, because at the current sixth graders, it would have been given Chromebooks this year already. Yeah. Were they given Chromebooks then that were used, like that are really old already, that were replacing I'm kids not, that would have just gotten new ones this year, assigned I'm to them? not positive about that. Um, okay. But basically, we wanted to have a little bit of flexibility, because they're still working on those inventories on the elementary level. They supposed to have that wrapped up this week, so we can confirm how many we truly need for next year. Because the, the life of a Chromebook is really only four to five years, you know, and they get, a lot of them get damaged. We do repair them in-house now compared to when we used to pay for the insurance and ship them out, and that, you know, that was a disaster. So they'd go out and be gone for weeks. It was more costly than repairing the house, and sometimes they're not repairable. Even when we had the insurance, we used to get notices all the time that they can't repair it. So looking at replacing two classes and possibly a third class, but I'm not sure what that is. I didn't have that information. I know Melissa was working with the house on the final counts. So that's why we wrote in the resolution the way it is. And actually, we got a, that second quote that came in about 30 minutes for the board meeting actually came in lower than the original quote. But I don't want to give out names just because we're waiting mm -hmm. on other quotes. You never know who could be watching and the, doing that. Uh, so that's really why we wrote the way it is. And you know, we're looking at just making sure that everyone has the working technology and going forward and making sure that we continue our program with being one to one from grade six to 12. But this is all just what we've been talking about mm -hmm. every year. This right. is when we replace yeah. This is nothing and new. We set aside about. 250,000 in PI each yeah. year for right. Chromebooks and replacements. And even last year, you know, we bought 900 uh, to replace two classes. Uh, we had 200 extras that went to teachers and for repairs and replaced the ones that were Right. This is nothing new. Right. Okay. So what we've been doing. And we've done a really good job, I think, with the Chromebooks. I think my, my senior is going to graduate this year, and he's had the same one since, I think, eighth grade. I think there's some discussion, too, about not collecting them back and letting the kids have them over the uh, summer as well. Because it's just, we, we use them so close to the end of the school year. It's, it's, it's going to be such a pain. To be able to collect them, is, it's been a headache. And I'm still, like, yeah. interested in what we do with the old ones if um, mm -hmm. we can have some kind of a program where kids could buy those yeah. that reduce cost or something. I mean, we had that discussion at that ops. I think we just need to yeah. sit down and finalize we had the old, We had that, like, with the old desktops, I remember, too. They would just That's get rid good. of them and they were, I think, Yeah, five something. bucks or ten yeah, bucks. Something. Yeah, because by the time they're, they're done using them, they're not... They're not Plus they're obsolete. Right. Usually it's eight to ten years. <laughs> so it's been so long since we've done any type mm -hmm. of textbook adoptions. Um, these 
these Chromebooks are well in line with right. the classroom oh, yeah. set of textbooks would cost. So um, they're probably the same. I would say half a million dollars to probably an estimate for a class set of That's what I looked up and said. Yeah, oh, we haven't bought them in so long. Yeah. 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 Are you looking at me? Is there any other donation? Any other questions? <laughs> <There's a> donation, <laughs> Belinda? Oh, yeah, okay, so I'll read the donation. We have a donation from Nick D'Angelo to the Lemuth Robotics Club, so we'd like to thank him for that. Very Excellent. Good. If there's no other discussion, can we call the roll? Please. All right, so I, we're all items. Yes. A through J. A through J. Jennifer Harden. Aye. Jack Miley. Aye. Belinda Grassley. Aye. Tom Heck. Aye. Steve Jesse. Aye. Motion carried. Personnel. We have a motion to approve the items listed on the personnel consent agenda as recommended by the superintendent. Items A through G. A second. A second. Thank you. Did we need to pull it out so that I don't vote on? Right. I think based on our dis discussion we had earlier today. So we've got to pull out that you want to pull off the seventh and eighth grade. Anything with seventh and eighth grade athletics. So C. Items uh, C. C and C, C. C and D would be the two items to pull out separately. Thank you. Did somebody second that? I'm sorry. I'll yeah. second that. Didn't you read it? Jeffrey's already second. I didn't motion for that. Right. So you wanted to say discussion. I'm good. I just want to say that uh, I appreciate the young ladies that are retiring from food service. Uh, they've spent their career taking care of our kids mm -hmm. generation after mm -hmm. generation, mm -hmm. and they're going to be hard to replace. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And to clarify, we're voting on items A, B, D, and F. Yes. Okay. Ready for the roll call? I, yep. yeah, can we call the roll, please? Right. Jack Riley? Aye. Belinda Grassi? Aye. Tom Heck? Aye. Steve Jeffries? Aye. Jennifer Hart? Aye. Motion carried. Now we have items C and B. So motion to approve items C, C and E. Uh, uh, yeah, a motion to approve items C and E. Can I have a second, please? I'll second. Say. Go ahead, Tom. Okay. Give it to Tom. <laughs> 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 if discussion? there's any discussion on that, and if not, can we call the roll on items C and E? Jack Miley? Aye. Linda Grassi? Aye. Tom Hack? Aye. Steve Jeffries? Aye. Jennifer Hart? Abstain. <coughs> Motion carried. Very nice. Uh, can, curriculum programming. Curriculum and programming. Motion to approve the items listed under curriculum and programming consent agenda as recommended by the superintendent. Uh, I believe it's A through E. Oh. F? Wait, yeah, where's F? Oh, the bottom. Yeah. Missed it. Okay. A second. Thank you. Any discussion on all these things? <laughs> um, I just want to thank the people that go to go to the limits to put together these camps. I know Julia's here every year when we approve a camp, and every year I keep telling her I'm coming to camp, but she never sees me at camp. But, um, Jeez. These folks put together some really awesome programs, and it's really great to see. Yep. Okay, roll call, please. Belinda Grassi. Aye. Tom Hanks. Aye. Steve Jeffries. Aye. Jennifer Hart. Aye. Jeff Miley. Aye. Motion carried. Buildings and grounds. Okay, motion. Uh, motion to approve the items listed on the buildings and grounds, same agenda items A through O, uh, as recommended by the superintendent. I'll second. Thank you, Mrs. Harden. Mm -hmm. um, so most of the items are change orders, which we, we kind of went over to, to some degree uh, earlier in the meeting, uh, talking about this is really not uh, out of the ordinary and uh, it's it's for the most part they're they're tweaks but the the last agenda item is the uh, TBA pre bond service agreement and just to, to for clarity on the board and for people in the room and those who might be listening that is not going into this contract is not 
this is really <coughs> meaning that we are imminently going to move forward with a with a a, a bond. Right. Uh, it's not saying it's May. It's not right. giving a date for November. It's not doing any of those things. It's just agreeing to the pre-bond service agreement. And right. at this point, it isn't the contract isn't costing the district anything. Right. Um, it would only cost the district something if first we put up a bond and it passed, and then we decided to go with another company. Right, right. now, uh, TDA will provide pre-bond services for us for at no cost. Uh, you know, they'll be doing some work for us. Right. Thank you for the question. <coughs> Which we have to go through anyway, regardless of when we would choose to put a levy on or not. I mean, we have to go through this process, so. Right. And, and pursuant to the request of the board at the last meeting, the calendar that was passed out earlier is incorporated into the contract as well. So there are clear deliverable dates. Or Thank you approximate deliverable dates as to what you're going to see when right. and as you heard earlier they plan on being at all your board meetings yeah. right for the foreseeable future until you tell them to stop showing up very good i have i have a question regarding um, the furniture um how many contracts have you bid bid one out here yeah well, i kind of handle the because they're construction manager at risk they handle all of the uh, bidding for that uh bidding was not it was bid out in the four different packages by uh, teacher and office related fashion materials, a uh, student desk, and music. Uh, we did not receive any bids on the music package. That's not included in tonight's thing. Uh, for student desks and chairs, we only received two bids. Uh, for classroom and teachers, we had one bid from each of those. Uh, we did compare what their bids came into, what we estimated them to come into, and they were pretty much in line. And it's also kind of in line with the uh, dollar per square foot that they've seen for other projects they get bid out. Per square foot, the typical range is anywhere between eight and ten dollars. That's kind of the standard. The problem is when we were going through some reductions in cost um, that was taken out of the budget, we went from what was adequate. Uh, down to about four hundred thousand dollars, I think it was Gary it was per building. The original budget was seven nine dollars and twenty one yeah. nine dollars and twenty one cents a square foot. It was like six hundred ninety some thousand per building, yeah. and then Fanning Howie cut it down to four hundred fifty thousand during the value engineering process, which was now we're back up where we should be. But well, Mr. Placco, um, uh, there was four bids out, and is it not true? One, two, and three were in approximate order, uh, under a million dollars. So my point is, uh, if they're all close and we went with four, which is 1.3, we'll, why didn't we look at three uh, instead of four? I think you're looking at the different, there's, there was different bid packages, mm -hmm. not necessarily the lowest bidder. The different bid packages included different mm -hmm. types of furniture. Uh, the bid package three, which is actually the bid package we're selecting, includes the flexible furniture for 21st lear lear century learning environments compared to uh, bids one and two were more of the traditional uh, non-flexible, non-movable furniture. Uh, they cut out a lot of bookshelves and storage spaces and chairs and it was basically the bare bones package for bids one and two or three was including all of the items that were recommended from the uh, committee that went through all of the furniture items they went to OSBA and looked at samples down there we had samples delivered to Hill Road and some of the quality differences too between the different pieces of furniture uh, some of the bids that we received included a different type of uh, a lower quality furniture that was not part of the architect specs and they recommended us not using those lower quality furniture because we then we end up replacing that furniture uh, much sooner and shorter warranty periods and things like that so well my understanding is like bid package one and two i think you're saying too like you're literally talking like one chair in a principal's office like this is really really also, the difference in quality, I think, was fifty thousand uh, dollars difference between right, the higher quality yeah. and lower quality. Well, I know we want new. We we have we're going to have great great buildings, but I mean, um, I just want to make sure that financially uh, we're within our budget. I mean, one point three million uh, versus the other three, which is almost four hundred thousand dollars difference. 
I mean, that's a considerable difference. And but I don't want to know package if that's one or two, you, we may still be spending more money if they're not giving us everything we need in it. In the scheme of things, mm -hmm. $400,000 between a couple buildings isn't a whole heck of, I mean, it is a lot of money, but it is, in the scheme of things, it's not. Right. It's, it's, it's a great deal, of, it's, a, it's a great deal of money because if we're looking at putting a levy on, we want to make sure that the community know that we're using their dollars in the right set. Yeah. Well, and these are our bond dollars. We're not. So, yeah. and, and that that's the reason why we're going with the higher quality. We don't want to be replacing furniture in the next couple of years. We're trying to do we're trying to do it right. Right. So right. just to uh, tie into, I certainly understand what you're, you're talking about. It's 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 the best value versus lowest price. It's kind of what we're talking about. But when Mr. Miley and I went with Mr. Winter to to Lamuth, as we mentioned earlier. We went to one of my old classrooms, and, and, and a desk was there from the time that I'm sure it was there, and, <laughs> which, which, which I even sat on. So, so, but but you know the, the point is that the building was initiated in the in the 60s. I was there in the 70s, and it's still here in you know means 2000. It means the quality was good. Right, the quality was it's right. It's <laughs> yeah, the high quality. Yeah, right, 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 so, cool. it, so the, the bottom line is, if we're able to. Uh, for the law, you know, it's, it's not nothing. That the difference is so not we nothing. Be but that over there and saving money. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure about that. There's also, I mean, there's no doubt historically the furniture that districts bought was high quality and that it was durable and lasted forever. It was not high on the comfort scale. Right. That's true. And Even today, it was not very back and tried to sit. I always had teachers who were always saying to me, "Mr. Riley, please sit still." And, I somehow took that personally. I think it was the furniture that was my problem. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's my theory now. Run with that. The stuff lasted forever. There's no question about that. And you can still buy at that six dollars a square foot number or five fifty a square foot that furniture. It it, it will last forty to fifty years. Uh, the difference, though, is I think what the district looked at was what's going to be best for the education of students and allow teachers to move that stuff around. Uh, a lot of times the furniture that you're talking about was harder and heavier to move. Nowadays a lot of the stuff is on wheels so the kids can move seamlessly into groups, get back into direct instruction, turn around, face a classmate. So it, it, you're, you're getting something dramatically different than what perhaps some of us went through back in our youth. We, we, we owe it to the community to put in new things in a new Everything building. It's like, it's, like, uh, it's like the football field. We, we do the redo the football field. We're not going to put in our old goalposts. Or, you know what I mean? It's, it's just, we, there's a time where when, when we have the opportunity, and it doesn't happen very often in our district where we're able to pass a bond, we got to do it right. And part of doing it right isn't only the shell of the building, the brick and mortar, it's what we put in it. I think you know, a lot of it is also we designed curriculum and we designed the facilities to be used in a certain way and if we don't have the furniture that goes with that level of instruction or that type of instruction it doesn't serve its purpose anymore and so I think uh, I believe we, we would it with bid number three as well or bid number two and Gary I would like to remove item M and put it on its own separate please the furniture bid yes <clears throat> And I also want to talk about the sensory room. Um, can you explain what, let the uh, community know what the sensory room is? Sure, so in the, in the two new buildings, both at Riverview and Parkside, we have specialized classrooms and both of those are going to be housed in both of those um, buildings. One is uh, classrooms for our students with multiple disabilities. The other building will house, that will be at um, Riverview. At Parkside, we will have uh, classrooms for our students with autism, as well as our students that have social emotional behavioral disabilities. The majority of the students with autism have sensory needs, yes. as well as students with multiple disabilities, and the students that have the uh, social emotional behavioral issues will also benefit from the sensory rooms. They have strategies and supports actually built into their IEPs that are written into their IEPs that need to be carried out on whether it be a daily or weekly basis. The money that is being utilized for these classrooms is coming from our special education restoration grant that we received from the state. We did not have, we did not know we had this money initially at the beginning of the year. We received this money. There are certain limitations, there are guidelines what it can be spent on. 
this is actually a very, in my opinion, a very good use of the money because these needs have to be met in some way, shape, or form. So having a, a classroom, not only will it benefit the students with disabilities, but it can be accessed by other students that might need breaks throughout the day, et cetera, as well. Okay. But the money is... But the is money's not coming from... Correct. Okay. That's the, the correct. one thing I want to mention, too, with the, the furniture is um, if, if you use the formula of even the top end, uh, ten ten dollars a square foot in each of the buildings, seventy five thousand square feet. You're looking at in line with this, this formula would be about one point five million dollars to adequately um, uh, buy enough furniture and the right quality furniture for the for the buildings. So we're not we're not offline on that. We're 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 actually a, a little. What's the total we have? Uh, the 1.3 wasn't the it? The total, it was like 1.351. Yeah, 1,351,000. That included now the furniture, but the like same yeah, RP. About $10, $10 no. a square foot, so we're actually a couple hundred grand lower. Okay. Um, what the industry say it says that we would need. I am done. Uh, okay. So the, the modified motion is to approve things on the items on the buildings and grounds. Items A through L and N through O. Um, any other discussion on, on those items? Can you call the roll, please? Tom Hack? Aye. Steve Jeffrey? Aye. Jennifer Harden? Aye. Jack Miley? Aye. Belinda Grassy? Aye. Motion carried. Okay. Billions Grounds motion uh, to approve uh, the recommendation item M, furniture bid. Uh, any discussion on, any further discussion on that? Can you call the roll? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll second, you, no. I'll second no. it. Uh, uh, thank you. With that, can you call the roll, please? Tom Hack? Aye. Steve Jeffries? Nay. Jennifer Harden? Aye. Jack Miley? Aye. Glenda Grassy? Aye. Motion carried. It takes us to the Board of Education update. If anyone's got anything. I just want to say the Hoops for Hope is tomorrow in the field house at 7 o'clock. It's the teachers against the Lake County first responders. That's $3 donation, yes, at the door. And all the proceeds are going to the Riverside Veterans Memorial. Blund and I will be there helping. <laughs> also, Mr. Carden, I did uh, contact Mr. Bliat. So Sorry. that senior project day is Wednesday, May 29th at 7. Excellent. Thank you. And before our next board meeting, we will have our egg hunt on the third. Yeah, uh, 13, Saturday the 13th. Yep. At 2. Awesome. Yeah. Come out to the egg hunt. 14,000 eggs. We've been out there Maybe in some serious snow. weather, Chuck. A lot of Canadian, <laughs> a lot of Canadian beans. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'll snow. Oh, my God. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's a terrible day. All right. With, has anyone else got anything else for us? What time is the event? Two o'clock. On the thirteenth of April. Jack, are you referring? Uh -huh. On the thirteenth. Yes. Who's at home with cross game? No, no. At one o'clock that day. Oops. This could be an interesting break. <laughs> What's on one o'clock? <laughs> There's a home with cross game. There wasn't four months ago when we scheduled. <laughs> it's definitely on my calendar. Uh, April thirteenth at two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, the egg hunts five minutes. The they can do it at halftime. They can do it at <laughs> halftime. <laughs> to see if you can. Might want to look. <laughs> well, we could always go back to the front of the building, which we used to do. Just push it later. Games are 90 minutes. Just, you know. Yeah, what time do they start? One. It looks like it's only varsity point. 230? Unless they had a JV. Is that their first game? No, their first game was yesterday. How did they do? JV lost in varsity one. Oh. Against West G. Do we have a master schedule for them? Sure. Should be so no, so mm -hmm. My daughter's running track. Right? <laughs> All right, with that said, let's make a motion to adjourn to executive session at 9 4 p 14 p.m. If I have a second, please. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Grassi. Roll call, please. Oh, it's for the purchase or sale of property. Yes, sir. Sorry. Steve Sorry. Aye. Jennifer Harden. Aye. Jack Miley. Aye. Linda Grassi. Aye. Tom Hack. Aye. Motion I might be coming carried. to camp. Thank you all. I might come to camp. Julie. Did you ever hear of Three Dog Night? Liar. Hey, we're still on.